All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. So welcome to the Black Archives Safer at Home virtual series. I am the Assistant Archivist. My name is Louis Burthen. And today I'm doing my segment called Legacies, Profiles and Greatness. And we will be focusing on Kelsey Leroy Farr, who in my opinion is a legendary figure in Overtown's history. So we'll take it from the top. So Kelsey Leroy Farr was born in Chester, South Carolina in 1891. His mother died about six weeks after he was born, so he lived with his father. After a couple years, he actually went to go live with some relatives in New York and North Carolina. He attended Livingstone College, where he earned his Bachelor of Arts in 1912. He was actually one of the men who followed the work line down to this brand new booming city called Miami. So when he got here, he worked as a bellboy in the Royal Palm Hotel. If that's ringing any bells for you, it's because the Royal Palm Hotel was Flagler's Hotel. It was actually one of the biggest reasons why Miami was a success in its early years. So while working as a bellboy, uh, one of the colored undertakers in the city died. So in 1913, he and three others purchased the undertaking business. That same year, he left Miami to attend Renoir's Embalming School in New York. He, he received his license in 1914, and that same year he returned to Miami. Farr actually became Dade County's first licensed black embalmer and funeral director in 1914. He and his partners opened a mortuary at 1025 Northwest 2nd Avenue. It took about three years in business, but Farr was actually able to save up enough money to, per to buy out his partners. And in 1918, the mortuary became Farr's funeral home. So while I was doing my research, I apologize for that. Uh, I actually came across a Federal Writers Project interview that they did with Mr. Farr. So it actually, he gives a story about when he wanted to expand his business and how he went to Mr. Roddy Burdine of Burdine's department stores. And so for those of you who do not know, the Federal Writers Project was created in 1935. It was part of the New Deal, essentially. So the Works Progress Administration, the Federal Writers Project basically gave employment to historians, teachers, and writers. And one of the more famous projects to come out of the Federal Writers Project was the sla uh, was Born in Slavery, the Slave Narratives. And this particular interview with Mr. Farr uh, came from the American Life Histories. So for the people who are just joining, I'm talking about Kelsey Leroy Farr. All right, so this is an excerpt from his interview with the Federal Writers Project. And at this point, he revealed a fact that few people knew until a short time ago. I needed a little money to expand my undertaking business. I went to Mr. Roddy Burdine and I told him all about it and asked him to loan me some money. He said I had an honest face and he loaned me $900 without any security except my word. That's the kind of friend he was. He never said very much about what he did, but I'm not the only one he has helped. Both white and black, I paid him back as quickly as I could. What he loaned me made it possible for me to improve my business and give a better service. And that, of course, increased my income. It enabled me to get a more and better paying patronage. And I have been successful because Mr. B Mr. Burdine was my friend. Few people know anything about all the good he did and how often he gave a helping hand to those he befriended. So for those who are wondering, those $900 that Mr. Burdine gave to Kelsey Farr would roughly equal about $15,384. Hi, everyone who's joining in. I'm talking about Kelsey Farr, the owner and operator of Lincoln C City Cemetery and the Kelsey Farr Funeral Service. So in the late 1920s, Farr actually founded the Lincoln City Cemetery, which for many years was the only black owned and operated cemetery in Miami. He was even featured in an issue of the crisis in 1942, and the article described him and his cemetery. So let me read you that. Mr. Farr, one of Miami's most noted citizens, is owner of the Farr Funeral Home at 1025 Northwest 2nd Avenue and the Lincoln Memorial Park, the most beautiful Negro-owned cemetery in the South. He is also owner of the extensive realty holdings, but is best known for his many civic interests and numerous philanthropies. No other Miamian is more widely known throughout the nation. Also, while I was doing... Uh, my research, I came across an excerpt from the Coral Gables Museum on the origins of Lincoln Memorial Park. So I'll read you that. Lincoln Memorial Park's origins are somewhat shrouded in mystery. Fact and myth have blended together to produce one of Miami's most beautiful and enduring legends. The urban myth is described as follows. 
Lincoln Memorial Park Cemetery was located in what was then known as the Brown Subdivision, now known as Brownsville, and was founded in the early 1920s by a white realtor named F.B. Miller. According to the legend, Kelsey Leroy Farr, who would later become the first black embalmer in Miami, would cut down lynching victims he, he found hanging from trees and would secretly bury these people at night in Lincoln Memorial Park. He did this so that these lynching victims could have a dignified resting place and did so at his own personal risk. One night, as the story goes, Mr. Miller discovered Kelsey Farr performing one of these burials and instead of being irate, was taken by the man's compassion. As a result, Miller then decided to deed the property over to Kelsey Farr at a highly discounted price, thus making Mr. Farr one of the only blacks to own a cemetery in the South. Whether this legend has any bearing in reality is unknown, However, it is clear that the myths such as these often have their roots in reality. I'm going to continue reading. What is known for certain is that F.B. Miller had established Lincoln Memorial Park by 1923, and what can be inferred is that Farr began purchasing pieces of the property from Miller by the fall of 1923, when the Farr uh, funeral home books record their first burials there, culminating in the 20 acres being consolidated into one property under Farr's ownership in 1937. Under Farr, the Lincoln Memorial Park was touted as the finest colored cemetery in the South. He buried luminaries such as D.A. Dorsey, Miami's first African-American millionaire, H.E.S. Reeves, the founder of Miami's first black newspaper, Arthur and Polly Mays, activists for, in, for education in the underserved town of Goulds, as well as everyday laborers who helped build Miami. So real quick, I would like you guys to put on your skeptic glasses because I would like to cast a little suspicion onto this story. I don't want to discredit the work of the Coral Gables Museum, but as they say themselves, they don't know if that story has any bearing in reality. Knowing what I know about the real estate business in Miami, especially white realtors, I find it highly unlikely that this story is true. Also, in the Federal Writers Project, so in a story such as this, I think would have gotten at least a mention, and it doesn't at all. But I'll continue. So, Farr being an entrepreneurial business leader, established other services that were first in Colored Town. He is credited with establishing one of the first community public telephones and a Western Union service. He is also credited with being the first black to own and operate an ambulance service in the city. There is another uh, excerpt from the Federal Writers Project that I'd like to read to you about a funeral insurance plan that he fought against and actually developed himself. So I'll read it to you. So what can you tell us about the funeral insurance plan to which so many Negroes adhere? Well, he said, that is another racket. It was started as a means to help colored people save towards a fund that would pay funeral expenses when needed. We found that funerals were costing too much and people were being fleeced and being made to pay often more than double what the funeral really cost. And unless they fulfilled every requirement laid down in the contract hard for them to understand, they did not get any benefits at all. For instance, the contract required that the death must occur in Dade County. If you happened to be in another county and met with an accident, your contract was void. If you were all paid up except for one payment, which was not due yet, you lost everything because you were not paid up at the time of death. The racketeers were so persuasive that you could not keep our people from signing up with them. We got up a committee and went to Tallahassee and tried to have the racketeers dealt with by legislation on the ground that they were doing an, ins an insurance business without a license. The effort failed because it had white backing. Then continued far. We saw that we must fight fire with fire. I had once organized a funeral benefit society of my own, had canvassers all over Colored Town and registered seven hundreds of subscribers. But I also did this. I gave them a square deal so that they got their worth of their money and I also made it a leading item in my plan that if they die before the contract was paid up, they were properly buried and the family had time to pay the balance no matter where they died and they were given that burial. They did not have to die inside of Dade County, that's how we got rid of that racket. There are many more partial payment and installment payment plans that must be taken care of. I intend to serve my people in this way as long as I live. He has over 500 members of his funeral benefit organization upon which he about breaks even for he has overhead expense that takes up the small profit. So I really like that excerpt from the interview because again, this was his business, but he's at the same time helping his community because the white people, the white businessmen who were doing this in the first place were just taking advantage of the people of Colored Town. So I really love the story because Farr 
take it upon himself to fight that. So seeing all this, Farr was also one of the founders of the Colored Board of Trade. He took the position of secretary, and on October 16th of 1915, he wrote an article with the Miami Metropolis. So this article, when I discovered it, when I started working at the archives, was incredible. Like, it blew me away because we have a lot of great stories, but what we don't, what this gave me, which blew me away, was hard numbers to everything going on in Colored Town in 1915. So I'm going to read you some of my favorite excerpts from this article, which was all written by him. The civic life of the colored people of Dade County and the city of Miami is best judged by the following figures which have been gathered by the Civic Committee of the Colored Board of Trade. It is safe to say that these statistics are very reasonably stated. The committee was unable to obtain the exact figures for, reason that very, for the reason that very recently a state census has been taken and those figures are not to be published before a certain given date. Approximately, there are 7,000 colored people in Dade County and their holdings in real estate otherwise aggregate to $800,000. They are in the city of Miami, approximately 5,450 Negroes, and their holdings in real estate and personal property easily aggregate to $500,000. We give here the names of several colored persons who have accomplished much in their chosen lines of endeavor and are comfortably situated for years to come. Jeter Walker, who is the owner and operator of the Lyric Theater, uh, J.H. Howard, D.A. Dorsey, uh, the first black millionaire in Miami, Thomas O'Garris, E.W.F. Stirrup of Coconut Grove, H.S. Bragg, Nelson Thompson, S.J. Boyd, J.J. Hurd, Mrs. Ella Griffin, Mrs. Hattie Reddick, Mrs. Laura Gaskin, Dr. W.B. Sawyer, uh, Dr. S.M. Frazier, and Israel Jones, and others who have taken advantage of the wonderful opportunities which the county and state have to offer. So bear with me for the next part. This, is, this part list, it literally is just a list of all the businesses that were in Colored Town at the time. And I really believe this is worth it because for a long for a long time we know that Colored Town was called the Harlem of the South, and I think this the number of businesses that were here already in 1915 kind of helps illustrate that point. So in the city of Miami, there are owned and oper owned and controlled by race loving Negroes three drug stores, six refreshment parlors, one theater, 17 grocery stores, four meat markets, five fish markets, nine barber shops, two bicycle shops seven boarding houses, two fruit stands, 17 hackmen, nine draymen, four real estate officers, 11 restaurants, four lunch counters, three insurance companies, one savings association, two undertaking parlors, the firm of Carter and Farr having the only licensed colored embalmers south of St. Augustine, 12 tailor shops and pressing clubs, two expert cutters, one plumber, one printer, one blacksmith shop, two bakeries, one ice dealer, 14 dressmakers, five shoe shine parlors, one milliner and dealer in notions, one furniture store, one carriage, an automobile trimmer and painter, three hair emporiums, two upholsterers, two shoemakers, and two liverymen, and seven stone, wood, and painting contractors. So there was a lot going on, and there was a lot of business people in Colored Town, which is incredible which you can see that kind of with that number of businesses going on, you can understand why the number, the aggregate number was over 500,000 for the personal property in Colored Town. So all with this, right? I, in this original article, it actually mentions the Civic Committee of the Colored Board of Trade. And that, that actually became an offshoot on its own. And that became the Negro Civic League. And Mr. Kelsey Farr was a president of the Negro Civic League so Farr was also a community leader, and he not only gave his time, but his money to, well, he gave not only his money, but his time to a lot of activities in Overtown. In 1926, he actually sponsored the first African-American Boy Scout troop in Miami, uh, Troop 56 of Mount Zion Baptist Church. So interestingly, the scouts were actually unable to afford the purchase of their uniforms. So Farr sent them to Burdines, and he paid for all of it. For his dedication to the scouts, they, have, they actually gave him a Silver Beaver Award. So I don't know about you guys, I was never a Boy Scout, so I didn't know what a Silver Beaver Award was. So that's, I'm going to read to you what the Silver Beaver Award was straight from the scouts. The Silver Beaver Award is the council level distinguished service award of the Boy Scouts of America. Upon nomination by their local scout council and with the approval of the National Court of Honor, recipients of this award are registered adult leaders who have made an impact on the lives of youth through the service given to the council. 
The Silver Beaver is an award given to those who implement the scouting program and perform community service through hard work, self-sacrifice, dedication, and many years of service. It is given to those who do not seek it. <laughs> so it is quite the honor. And he was also part of the first advisory committee for Liberty Square, which is one of the first of its kind multi-million dollar projects in South Florida. So this first advisory committee was put together to assist the housing manager, Captain James E. Scott, and it included Father John Comer, Kelsey Farr, the president of the Negro Civic League, Dr. W.B. Sawyer, Professor Charles Thompson, and attorney R.S. Toomey. So Farr was also one of the first directors for Christian Hospital after the death of its founder, Dr. W.B. Sawyer. He also helped the organization with its move from its original location on 2nd Avenue to where, it's, to where it went in Brownsville. He was also very dedicated to his church. Uh, when Greater Bethel AME needed funds to finish the construction of the, of the church, he actually mortgaged his home and he got the $2,000 necessary for the completion of the project. He also organized a church group known as the Kelsey Farr Social Club. So I'd actually like to read to you another excerpt from the Federal Writers Project interview that gives a little insight into his dedication to the church. So the work among the young people of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church is also a major project with him. He is president of the Society of His Own Church in Miami, which is exerting a strong influence upon the young Negroes of the area, especially giving them social activities to keep them away from evil associations, encouraging them to make the most of their school and especially to abstain from gambling devices and occult practices. For 23 years, he has been at the head of the young people's work for his denomination throughout the South, and he has lent his influence to the development of the spiritual life among the young people of the several states where his church is working. So, real quick, I'd actually like to point out, he's like, the evil associations that he wanted to keep the youth to abstain from were the gambling devices. So, in Miami, especially around this time, it was known as one of the leakiest cities in, in the United States. Of course, prohibition started in 1920 and ended in 1933. Uh, liquor and gambling went hand in hand. And actually, there was a story, there's a news article of police breaking in, breaking down and breaking into the Lyric Theater to break one of the slot, slot machines that Jeter Walker had installed there illegally. It also bears worth mentioning that the police counted, uh, accounted for a lot of their profit that year from doing things like that. So the other thing I'd like to point out is the occult practices. And remember that Miami really, even in the beginning, was an immigrant city. A lot of the people of color who were coming to Miami were Bahamian, Jamaican, and Haitian. And they brought with them voodooism. And it's really specifically mentioned in the Federal Works Project. So we give a lot of credit to the churches in the early history of Overtown because of the work they did organizing. But this gives another insight to another part of the religious practices in, in Colored Town which I think is really interesting. So his excellent record in all walks of life eventually got the attention of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt actually appointed Farr as the consul to the Republic of Liberia in 1943. The Liberian government even recognized him for his efforts in this position and they knighted him. So the name of the organization that, that knighted him was the Knights of Brotherhood of Humane Society for African Redemption. He was also awarded two honorary law degrees, one from his alma mater, Livingstone College, and the other from Bethune Cookman. Dade County also honored him by naming an elementary school after him that is located at 2000 Northwest 46th Street. And unfortunately, Kelsey Farr died in April of 1964. So that pretty much covers Kelsey Farr's life and his works. And I'm ready to take your questions. And while I'm waiting for you guys to type out your questions, I'm gonna do a little bonus section. So Kelsey Farr had a son and his son's name was Kelsey Leroy Farr Jr. So if you search him up, you actually find he has a mini bio on IMDb. He was credited as an actor and a member of a, of a singing group called the Delta Rhythm Boys. He was listed as a baritone. So the three movies that he was credited in was High Good Looking, 1944, Follow the Boys, 1944, and So's Your Uncle in 1943. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much Kelsey Farr, and that was a little bonus section about Kelsey Farr's son. 
So if you guys have any questions, I'm ready to answer it. Oh, you know what? I also, let me just show you a photo. This is a photo of Kelsey Farr. And down here, we actually also have a little photo of the Lincoln City Cemetery. That was from its bicentennial in 76. And for a little bonus bonus, let me show you his feature in The Crisis, which had a very good photo of him. So there you see Kelsey Farr, and it's in, and you see right up there in the top right corner, the crisis. And that was from an issue in 1942. So yeah, I mean, overall, fantastic guy. All the amount of work that he did, it really is incredible. And I, I also appreciated that I got to learn a little bit about the Boy Scouts, seeing as how I was never one of them. Yeah, 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 KPZ. The funeral home, yeah, he's really well known for his funeral home, but he did a lot of other things, which I, he doesn't get credit for for nearly enough. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jocelyn. I thought it was cool little trivia, too. I, I, was, I was so pr impressed when I came across it. He actually talks about his son and how he's going to go to Hollywood because the Federal Works Project interview actually was conducted in 1939. So his son hadn't appeared in the movies yet. They'd come about three, four years later. So in the meantime, just waiting to finish up, uh, remember that tomorrow at 12, we have our virtual field trips with the director, Timothy Barber. And on Saturday, we have a very special story time in color at 11 a.m. with master storyteller and author Dylan Pritchett. So please make sure to join us for that. All right. So... Thank you guys for joining me. I'm going to be back again next week with another Legacies, Profiles, and Greatness. And thank you for joining me again. I really look forward to seeing you guys next week. Oh my god, yes. And we have our Lyric Live uh, Living Room Edition tomorrow night. So please make sure to join us for that. That's going to be a lot of fun. Cello is going to be hosting and we're going to have the whole crew getting together to do a live show on Instagram. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate everything. And you can see the on the comments to follow the Lyric Theater MIA because that's where it's going to be hosted. And of course, we're going to be pushing the notifications out. So just keep watching if so you can follow, right? Thank you, everybody.